Welcome to the No Clip. I'm Chad Rowe. I'm JJ Artemis. And I'm Andy Kay. And today, uh, the No Clip newscasting team, I guess. <laughs> Dude, newscasters don't get to be exclusively enthusiastic about their audio-based content. <laughs> Alright, that's fair. <clears throat> and today, we're going to be talking about Super Mario RPG, the legend of the four stars. <laughs> if you're Chad. Yeah. Uh, also me. Uh, you only got four as well? I also only got four, uh, and then looked up the rest, because uh, my soul can only take so much. Mm. Man. I thought that you would definitely have finished it, mm-hmm. since you're, like, the JRPG guy. I, I mean, I sort of uh, sped run it in my mind, which is uh, <laughs> <laughs> a way of saying I uh, watched a Let's Play from that point mm-hmm. onward, because I could multitask it with other important things to do with my life. All right. And I thought you were the JRPG guy. Uh, JJ's the one, or at least this is my perception, I might be, like, stereotyping JJ here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, like, the one that, like, went in his younger days, got, like, super into JRPG systems and things. Yes! As a wee lad. Yeah. I think. <laughs> That's actually what the second J in his name stands for. JRPG lad? Yeah, JRPG RTMS. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Back when I had, like, seven names, that's what they all sort of... Yeah, it was a... <laughs> you had, like, a whole... If you were to t- write out your initials, it would be JJRPGA3. <laughs> it's really difficult to put together. Anyway, so this game is, as we're clearly discussing right now, a JRPG. And uh, it was released in 1996. Uh, it was, of course, developed by... Square, Squaresoft, as they were called at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, Nintendo. So there, there was significant Nintendo input on this project. Yes. Yeah, they're significant. They are credited more as a producer or as a production. I'm pretty credit. sure, like Miyamoto, like oversaw the whole project. Yeah, but there was a lot of uh, of Nintendo, and you can, I mean, it's pretty clear. I would say, uh, from the way that, like, the Non RPG battle elements are handled. Yeah, they, don't get me wrong. Uh, despite uh, all the jokes at this game's expense, you can tell relative to the SNES era that it was brought up in that it would be the kind of thing that Nintendo would put their you know seal of quality on and release into the public. Yeah, hundred percent. They were like, if we're gonna do an RPG where Mario uh, is like the protagonist. He's got to still jump all over the place. <laughs> right. He's got to be like a jumpy, like jump man living up to his name. So it's got to be at a weird isometric perspective so that he can jump. <laughs> Damn it, yeah. you beat me to making fun of the isometric perspective on how weird of a decision that was for this game. Why did they do it? I don't know. It'll... So Mario can jump. I'm the Yeah, I think Andy's correct here. I think that because if it was a top-down thing... He wouldn't be able to jump, and if it was like a weird third person, that that technology just wasn't there. Why couldn't it just be two D? Isn't Paper Mario two D? Like two D, like a side scroller. But it's a yeah. side scroller. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's I, that's not Square Enix's thing. Well, think about. Have, have you ever played a J, an RPG at all, for that matter, that has like towns and shit in it? That's a side scroller. No, I mean, well, you like Zelda like, Two has yeah. towns. There's like Metroidvania RPGs, like Child of Light, but they aren't generally isometric either, which is why it sticks out to me that this was like an intentional choice from Square. Yeah, yeah. it's so that you can like see the 3D space and can do the light platforming that's in the game, mm-hmm. and like yeah, jump and be able to see how far you jump, have depth perception. While still having some sense of a space there that you're walking around, not just be like a 2D cut-off plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like the combination, it's, it's, at least in 96, is likely the only solution for the combination, like, uh, of a platformer and a JRPG, trying to put those two things together. Uh, Though, I mean, arguably they probably didn't need to do that, and if you <laughs> no. played any of the future RPG games in this pseudo-franchise, you'll know that they've kind of dropped that as, like, a thing. Uh, but, you know. I'm not going to blame them for the attempt, certainly. Especially since the isometric perspective allowed them 
to be really, really pretty for a SNES game. Yeah, this game looks super good. Mm -hmm. I can almost see the jumping thing being like a Miyamoto decision. Like, you guys can make a Mario RPG, but Mario has to jump. (laughs) (laughs) Jumping is even like, within the game's mechanics, jump is considered like an element. Like a magical (laughs) element Mm -hmm. that things can be weak or resistant to. So it's kind of insane <laughs> that that occurs at all, but clearly you can see the, the influence there from its, like, uh, parent series. Mm-hmm. And good on them for trying to make actual, uh, like, SNES-era RPG overworld travel interesting. Yeah. And not only that, but it became, like... This probably surprises absolutely no one if you've heard us talk about, like, any other game. <laughs> uh but the what ended up being my favorite part of the game was the overworld. Uh, and and a lot of that is owed to the fact that the isometric perspective gives it, one, the ability to hide, like, secrets and Easter eggs, which are just all over this fucking thing. Yeah. And uh, also, like, yes, everything does look pretty good. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's like that merging it's like a half step between like a an adventure game like a 3d kind of environment exploration and a top down it's actually a good point that i never considered this is like sort of a weird hybrid of yeah. later rpg elements being incorporated back into adventure games and the console generation after that and mm-hmm. later yep it's like a pseudo 3d thing but god what a weird approach to go from it not from an adventure game with RPG elements, but from an RPG game, forced adventure elements grafted onto it. <laughs> yeah. uh, for the most part, though, like, unlike adv- in adventure games with RPG elements, uh, you don't have to really do any of the adventure gamey stuff. Like, uh, for my uh, lim- less than 100% <laughs> uh, exploration of this game... Were there, there were barely anything that you would consider, like, puzzles. There was Geno's Maze, but that's as much of a puzzle as the last level of Star Fox 64. Hmm. Uh, not that I really came across. And nothing on the critical path, anyway. No. Yeah. Uh, and that sort of, as I kind of felt like the whole Booster's Tower level was almost kind of a, a, a missed opportunity in that regard because like the way that he has it set up is it's portrayed as like a like some kind of like you know fucked up fun house like whatever that trope is mm-hmm. uh like arcade from the x-men is running this tower yeah, yeah, yeah. it's set up for your amusement and there's like a train track that goes across the walls and shit right like a childish joker yeah, but except he just never, uh, he never, like, there are a couple of puzzles, but not anything that's required. Like, you have to identify paintings, and right. j- you jump on a seesaw. Yeah, I, I kind of felt the same thing, but I don't, I'm never able to tell whether or not I'm just somebody that overvalues puzzles in games or not. Because, like, <laughs> uh, if there's, like, a JRPG that incorporates, like, puzzles into dungeons and stuff, I generally view that as a huge positive. But I don't know if other people share that opinion. I have to say that I 100% do, especially in this game. Uh, yeah, I would have enjoyed a puzzle element to it as well. It feels like it would fit a Nintendo game anyway. Yeah. And this game has... Without puzzles, this game has one thing that impedes your progress, and that is monotonous, (laughs) tedious, boring, (laughs) single song (laughs) combat. (laughs) Yes, yes, let the hate flow through you for the one song that you get to hear. The whole time. Yeah. Oh, I just turned the audio... I, I played this game without audio f- and listened to podcasts instead, <laughs> starting at, like, after I got the first star. Yeah, yeah it's kind of a shame, too, because I think the rest of the soundtrack is really good. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah, they uh, they are not bad songs. Uh, they are the same songs. Uh, yes, over and over. <laughs> it's unfortunate, tiny memory 
on the Super Nintendo. Is yeah. there legit question? Is there more than three combat songs in the game? I was unaware that there was more than one. <laughs> so. Uh, maybe, like, I'm sure the final boss has, like, a unique theme, probably. I'm counting that in three. Oh. It's, there's, a, there's the generic battle theme, the boss battle theme, and the final boss battle theme is all that I know of. Uh, then I don't think so. That's so tragic. <laughs> Not that, you know, the JRPG combat would have been, you know, so much more pleasurable without <laughs> any of that around it. I feel like it would have been. Like, I, I feel like there's a... So, my biggest gripe with this game, uh, other than that it's an RPG, uh, which I can get over, because I accept <laughs> that uh, evidently not everyone thinks RPGs are just inherently flawed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so <laughs> I'm really antagonizing the audience right now. It's okay. They uh, know that the, the majority of the podcast is actually with them, right. and can, so they can feel fine hating on you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, but... The way that this game, the, the the number of encounters that you have in this game is so high that I think that the that having just a randomized selection of like three or four songs would have genuinely made it more enjoyable of an experience. See, I actually think the encounter rate of enemies is a lot lower in this game than most JRPGs. It's you get some agency in the overworld over how many encounters that you have, which in a really perverse sense kind of speaks for itself there, when like, oh, you can use Mario's mechanics to completely avoid the other mechanics. <laughs> That's like, like you get rewarded for like grabbing stars and not having to do any of this battle nonsense. <laughs> you just bump into everybody and collect the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's sort of true, but yeah, the, it runs into the same issue... Uh, that, like, Bravely Default has, where it's like, you have to decide that you're going to have these encounters Mm -hmm. in order to not... So if you're doing what I was obviously, like, started to do immediately before realizing that it was not the way forward, which was just sprinting past all the enemies like I do in every game... Uh Uh, Classic. (laughs) But you end up being underleveled if you do that. So you Mm -hmm. have to make the decision to go into it, and so you end up with either you try and come up with some kind of pace of how often you would like to be battling, or you don't do it at all, and then you have to grind when you yeah. hit a wall. God. Yeah. I found the combat to actually be like decently enjoyable, especially for like the era that it was released in, but like I feel like my biggest gripe with the entire game is it just its limitations. Like, there's not a, b- a big enemy variety, and I feel like there's not enough variety in, like, the things you can do. Because, mm-hmm. like, I actually, I like the, like, timing the button presses. Like, it made me, like, actually engage with every combat encounter instead of just, like, mashing the A button. Mm. And uh, I like that blocking was weirdly satisfying to me. Yes. Uh, it's, I feel like if there was a greater variety of, like, stuff you could do... And more enemy variety, the combat system could have actually been, like, pretty great. The timing mechanic thing is something that's still in use today. That's something that that RPGs will occasionally throw out. The first one coming to mind for me being the recent South Park games. Mm. All just straight-lifted that timing system. Yeah, I Am Setsuna also has the Mario RPG timed button presses. But in this game, I'm completely with you. It just becomes monotonous so fast and the timings are so easy to execute that it the experience to me is very similar <laughs> to uh going through the guitar hero calibration screen uh, <laughs> <laughs> for yeah. hours that's that is that it is it becomes like the world's easiest rhythm game i have a i have <laughs> a really big hit the button difference with around. this yes uh and that is I, I'm really good at calibrating Guitar Hero controllers. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Uh, meanwhile, this was... Okay, so evidently you guys did not find this to be the case based <laughs> on this conversation. But I found the lack of any kind of prompt for the timing... You were timing. playing without the sound. 
I feel like that would be a huge issue. Oh, uh, well, I'm sure... Because, like, the audio feedback is, like, a pretty big indicator. <laughs> but, I mean, how are you supposed to even know when you're supposed to hit you, the button on you, any new attack? You experiment with it when you get a new weapon, and the way I did it was I watched the animations to, like, find, like, when... It's, it's like, like a parry timing. In yeah, Dark Souls. exactly. Yeah. You just have to learn when in the animation to hit the key. Just trial and error. Button. Yeah, and you'll have plenty of times to try. <laughs> That's true because of all the fun. Okay, so there are other things like, uh, do you have? This is stuff I don't even know because I I don't think I ever successfully did it. it are there defense uh, timing presses for magic attacks? And are do you get bonus damage on magic attacks for pressing at the right time as well? I know about the jump uh, one because it told me, and I know that the super jump you can do forever. Yeah. From my experience, no, you can't block projectiles or magic attacks. I might be wrong. Uh, and only certain magic attacks that you can get, like, a bonus on. Luckily, I didn't have to know or care because this is probably one of the most <laughs> trivial, e- trivially easy JRPGs uh, I have ever played. Man, I hate you guys so much. <laughs> I, like, I died to, like, every boss, I think. because you ran past all the enemies. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know, I would have to grind. <laughs> but even then, like, I don't know. I mean, it was mostly just sort of, like, I don't know, pressing the A button a lot. Yeah, like, like come on, Mr. Master of the Guitar Hero calibration screen. <laughs> Why didn't the, the infinite Mario Super Jump just trivialize the game for you like it did for me? I mean, that's a good point. Uh... Because I didn't have just infinite magic, I think. Uh. <laughs> Otherwise, that probably would have. Yeah, it sounds like you had the problem that I had when I played Pokemon as a kid, where I would avoid trainers. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, get to the gym leaders and just get stomped. Yeah, I think it was just super... I mean, I agree that there you don't have a ton of options in terms of, like, what you do in combat. And that that does make the difficulty a lot easier, because most of the time... You'll do fine just, like, rushing through. Mm-hmm. In addition, the fact that, like, using items occasionally would just be like, don't worry about it, you get to keep you the get item. You get a freebie. Yeah, you get a free item occasionally. As well as, like, there are tons of mechanics in here that make things, like, simpler to get through. Yeah. Uh, I think it was just, like, the early game. Like, before I got three party members, I found the game to be, like, crushingly difficult. <laughs> like, I was just being completely obliterated by everything. Yeah, like, in comparison to, like, pretty much any other JRPG I've ever played, this game was a total cakewalk. Yep. Yeah. Like, I found I, Chrono Trigger to be easier than this ooh, game. Not even close. Yeah, you can <laughs> <laughs> like I said, uh, I never finished, uh, or I didn't, at the time of recording, finish the boss rush to Chrono Trigger, but yeah. with the exception of that one side quest, I never had, like, a wall in that game. Mm. Whereas in this game, like, I died to the first boss, like the Hammer Brother, <laughs> learned that I had wow. to go back to my last save, which was, like, two hours not probably not that long, <laughs> but like <laughs> it was the whole game ago, basically, because I had to go back to the start, and I just like was like, I'll come back to this next week. <laughs> they didn't think that anyone would ever die to that boss. <laughs> I definitely did. <laughs> okay, question: While we're on the difficulty, when you were leveling your characters, what did you generally put stat points in? Um, I basically just picked whatever like. I perceived that character's role to be. I was like, Mario is like DPS, so I'll give him attack more often. And Mallow is magic, so I'll give him magic more often. Then I learned later from like watching a review that like you're supposed to, quotes around that, look at each one because you can select it and then back out of it. You don't have to select it right away Mm -hmm. if you hit A on it. And see which one gives you the biggest benefit and pick that one. Because then all the other two will only be like an increase of one. And then the third one will be like an increase of like four or five. I, I didn't know what? about this either. Yeah, I didn't know this either. But it's like it's like hand-holding you, telling you like which stats to pick each time. No, we're the worst at video games. <laughs> and terrible. I didn't even notice that. Nope, neither did I. Why would you? It's hidden behind Yeah, I just mashed A through it. I but, was like, I want that. Yeah, like decades <laughs> of... 
a, a prior conditioning suggests to us that, like, oh, this is a mechanic about giving us agency over how our characters yeah, develop. Yeah, that's actually not the case. Weird. In fact, now that I'm thinking about it, that bonus point, then, if you aren't picking the biggest one, is just always going to be, like, a waste. barely noticeable. Yeah, yeah like, a total mm-hmm. waste of a choice. So I played, like over three-fourths of the game before I learned that. <laughs> yeah. All right. I don't think it's going to be a waste, uh, maybe generally, <laughs> because I have a theory here. I think this is the first, like, generic RPG in history where the defense stat is the best stat. That's probably true. Yeah, yeah. that seems totally true, because I actually, the only wall that I hit uh, was right at the beginning before I've what the dinosaur with the top hat, yeah, whatever it is, Croco. Croco. Yeah, I I didn't re- I missed that you could buy armor in the Mushroom Kingdom, and like died to him, and then like went back and I was like, oh, armor, <laughs> I got it, put it on, went and fought him again, and was like totally fine. Like he did like not even close to as much damage to me. Yeah, you're right. I may have been exaggerating on all the bosses I died on. Definitely didn't die to him. Yeah. And I didn't die to the cake, either. Good job on dying to Good the cake. Good job. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> attack. Uh, <laughs> until, like, the very end. <laughs> this game gives you... Well, a, you are so heavily favored in all encounters, like, stats compared to the enemies. You're dealing, like, dozens of damage, and people, if you have, like, the armor that you're expected to have at the time... They deal like five to ten, and if you time your little button press right for the defense on most normal attacks, you just get zero. Yeah, they do like one to zero. So if you ha- if you keep your defense stat up high enough, that those small numbers when you get lower just round off to literally nothing. Mm-hmm. To be fair, it does get harder after the fourth star. Like after you get like the the fifth and the sixth one. It gets a little bit harder, but it's really not that much. <laughs> yeah, but not only that, but like, uh, but yeah, the early game is like just a, enemies do do like two damage to you. Yeah, I, I want to say like, because uh, I I quit playing this game, and by quit I mean like it was like seven a.m. and I was like I gotta sleep so I can get up and talk about this game. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh. When I when I stopped playing this game, I had just gotten Toadstool and I put her in, in the party, and she just like gets one shot by the or like two shot because I didn't have any armor for her, so her she just had like whatever the base stats are, and I think like fifty HP or something. Yeah. So she just gets like completely clobbered by everything, uh, which is pretty lame, but also shows a lot of how good just having some armor is. Yeah. Like, in almost every generic JRPG system, there are incentives in place that cause you to do the spam A button to attack through encounter thing that you were talking about before, Andy. Mm-hmm. Because when you're in an RPG, uh, killing something stops all of its damage forever. <laughs> so, oftentimes, if the numbers aren't balanced correctly, your best option, defensively and offensively, is to hit something with a sword. Uh, so most of the time, that's why everyone's just like, yeah, throw everything you have into damage all the time in every game. And that's over and above how rewarding it is just to see huge numbers hit the screen. But if you could round the damage you take off to zero... <laughs> then you have infinite time to deal as much damage as you want. But also the the defense stat, in the case of the level up bonuses, is tied to the attack stat anyway. Mm-hmm. So you just get the best of both worlds in this in that scenario. Mm-hmm. Plus there's plenty of equipment to like supplement any magic defense so that you don't get like completely devastated by magic attacks. So in the way that you get to devastate everyone with Thunderbolt constantly for, like, the mid... <laughs> like, hours two through four is just Thunderbolting well, and buying things to let you Thunderbolt more. Right. Well, I don't think I ever bought any, like, uh, magic point restorative items. Oh, yeah, because you didn't have the money, did you? Because you didn't have the XP or the money. You were just the poor Mario. Oh, no, collect. I had plenty of money. I just found enough flower tabs all over the place, mm. and they fully restore your magic points, so it, it didn't matter. Yes. Uh. <laughs> Not a lot of things that mattered. Yeah. 
But that's like <laughs> that, that that's like the whole thing with the the overworld though. Is because they packed it full of so many secrets, you just have so much shit all the time. Mm. Like my inventory was more or less full for the entire duration of the time that I played this game. Yep. Uh, that's a classic old RPG problem. Just constantly having your inventory filled. Why do I not remember, like, any games having a like an inventory limit that every time that I've run across one, I'm always just, like, infuriated by it? <laughs> yeah, like, older games, like... Pokemon, like the original Pokemon, had an inventory limit. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it just older games that had memory limitations always did. So anything before like two thousand whatever, <laughs> you know, had like a small inventory limit, and mm-hmm. it was super annoying. Yep, it just seemed uh, annoying how many times I had to drop things. But it boo boo doo boo. Hey, <laughs> speaking of music, uh. Do you... What was your least favorite song in the game? I need to know right now. My least favorite song? Yeah. What song burned you the most out of all songs with which you were burned? I feel like it had to have just been the stupid combat music. Because it was just... It just happened all the time. The the, the only song that... Keep in mind, I played a lot of this without the sound on. Mm-hmm. The only song that really jumped out at me was uh, the Booster's Tower music, because it was just kind of, like, funky and <laughs> and rocking, and I was into it. I'm happy for you. And I'm assuming you, Andy, are too nice to uh, hate any of the beautiful tunes you were given. Uh, no, I, I think I would answer the same as Chad. Like, by... I actually... I got to the last dungeon, like, the mandatory Super Nintendo JRPG super long and hard last dungeon mm-hmm. that I did not finish. <laughs> Uh, and by the time I got to that point, like, the battle theme was super grating to me, so that would be the one I would answer. That whistle soundtrack in Frog Fuchsia's little land pond area... Okay. It is the... maybe my least favorite song in any game. Wow. (laughs) Just, Just full stop. Anything that could be termed music... It has to meet the criteria of music. Right. But once it has, uh, I have never had anything that's fallen below. Uh, we're going to have to listen to that on the break, because I don't even remember it. That goddamned whistle. <laughs> that same whistle tune, just over and over again. <laughs> <Do you know? laughs> just infinitely. Uh, oh, it's oh. the fucking... Uh... <laughs> that! Yeah, it's, the, it's okay, in Mario Party. I, I do party. remember that, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, okay. So that's like a Koji Kondo song, isn't it? Probably. Okay. So my experience is, if you take a Mario, uh, just one like a Mario, of some one kind, unit of Mario, and then you put in a song with a whistle in it, I'm going to be infuriated by it. <laughs> so I hate that song as well. Fortunately, we didn't hear it during this game, uh, and I fucking hate the stupid whistle song from Mario 64. I, I love that song. I know you do, and it bothers me, because it's like being shot in the brain with a train whistle. I also love to whistle, so... <laughs> it's less obnoxious <laughs> when a human being is performing it, but when it's coming out of an N64 sound Okay, card, that's fair. Like yeah. the the I'll admit that the train whistle noise at the beginning is a little harsh. You have to be <laughs> so good at whistling as a human being for your whistling to be like grating and annoying. It has to be so loud. Because like actual human whistling for fun is normally sort of like a low melodic tune thing. But we're talking about someone who's like literally blowing into a train whistle. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know who wrote the music for this game, JJ? Uh, no. Uh, it's I can never pronounce her name. Kingdom Hearts soundtrack composer. Oh, oh. oh. I'm sorry she was so limited. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like it's like Shimomura or something. Yeah, Yoko. Like that. Yo- she, yeah, she, she her first Yoko name Ono. is Yoko, <laughs> not Ono though. Okay. Shikamura. Shikam. I don't know. But it was she, her. She did good things later when she had CDs. I like this soundtrack. Yeah, it's I think just, the soundtrack it's, is overall good. Yeah, like I've said earlier, like the biggest thing I think against all elements of this game is the limitations. There's just like not enough music. Mm. And the, the places where they were able to push the bar, just they don't hold up in retrospect. 
It's similar to Sly Cooper in that respect, though I'm nowhere near as harsh on this game as I am on Sly because this game was trying to be way more like iterative and interesting in its time. Mm -hmm. uh, but the things that I'm, that I'm thinking of that this game was great at were like the visuals, which at the time were crazy for you know a pixelated SNES game. Uh, and innovation in JRPG combat systems, where at the time it was like, you know, up against Final Fantasy VI, stuff like that. Yes, Chad? Uh, okay, so every time that we talk about a JRPG, yeah. we always say that it had some sort of innovation to the JRP combat system. Mm -hmm. Do we think that anything actually was an innovation on the JRP com JRPG combat system? Or do we think that the JRPG combat system that we think things are innovating on just doesn't exist at all? I mean, I've played Final Fantasy 1 and 3. Okay. Me but, too. but pretty soon after that point, it seemed like everyone was like, well, we can't just do that again. So they introduced a thousand different takes on it. Because, like, I don't find this combat system to be that much more innovative than, like, literally any other game <laughs> that I've ever played. They can be classified as JRPG. You know what? You have a good point, Chad. And I think this is something that. We, as, as a podcast, can admit that we have been roped into being guilty of and make our <laughs> penance here today, which is everyone takes small innovations to the JRPG combat system that over time bleed into like an amorphous hole where those differences aren't good enough to make you do different things in the system or change what you did in retrospect. When you think back to JRPGs, no matter what innovation they tried, you still think of hitting the attack button over and over and over again. Unless it's really radically different, which is not what this game or most games have been able to reach. Yeah, so far my favorite innovation uh, to the JRPG combat system that we've talked about uh, has been Earthbound's ability to not fight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were going to say Undertale. No, that's pretty good, but it's you still like have to fight things, thing. and that's like, yeah. oof, I'm not so sure about that. That's so far removed, I wouldn't even qualify it. It just shares menus. Yeah. And turns, technically. Mm. Yeah, I suppose so. The thing that's that, that I would always put... It is like a turn-based combat system, though. I know, but you can have a turn-based... Like, Fire Emblem is a turn-based combat system, but that's not a JRPG combat system. Mm, no, I guess not. Yeah. It's... The, the kind of stuff that I, I think I would put is the only one at the moment that I can think of as an, a real, actually important difference in the way that things worked was when uh, Square started implementing time-based turn order instead of strict turn order. Like when, I don't know, I don't remember if Final Fantasy VII was the first one, it might have been in six, but once meters starting, started filling as a ratio of your character's, like, speed stat or whatever, right. that actually made things kind of interesting and started the push toward, like, competitive menu selection speed that we've joked about before. Yeah. It seems like it was just a movement toward, like, action RPGs, but with still with menus. Yeah. I think we fit on all the big ones. Like, if you were to ask me what were, like, the biggest innovations to the turn-based JRPG system, it would have been the time bars... The Chrono Trigger active time battle thing right. where the enemies move around. And also, like, the Mario RPG time button presses. And it feels like anybody tries to make a retro RPG now, it has either one of those things or multiple of those yeah. things. You just got to throw all of them in there and be mm -hmm. like... It's, like, yeah. I Am Setsuna I brought up has all three of those things, <laughs> and that's its combat system. Right. <laughs> You're completely right. Even when we were talking about non-retro things, Chad, this was all steps on a movement that seems to have just gone straight for action RPG after that point, you can trace such a straight line from like Final Fantasy 3 to Final Fantasy 15 in terms of how much they started incorporating time, active movement of the things around you into the system, going from like there to 7 to 10 to 12 to now. Right. I mean, I say right. Like, I totally got it, <laughs> but I've only played two of the games that you said, so... Uh. Yeah, you had you had your time bars, you had your enemies doing shit independently, and then by 12, you had enemies sort of moving around you in 3D space, but they were still mostly controlled like an RPG, and now in 15, you just are a, like a weird... Like, menus are somehow built into the function of the world instead of being <laughs> little like menus. Like, actual menus, yeah. yeah. Well, now that we've busted the doors off of the JRPG conspiracy, <laughs> uh, you guys want to take a break?
Sure. Yes. All right. <laughs> Ask him the tough questions. <laughs> I'm sure everyone who, has, who plays RPG is already being <laughs> Welcome back from the break. Uh, we decided, because we basically harped on and on about uh, the looping battle music and the combat mechanics generally, that we want to try and get into uh, sort of the aesthetic that this game puts across. Yeah. Because as you mentioned uh, literally seconds ago, uh, we did talk about how this game is graphically pretty. Like, it looks good. Mm-hmm. They do, like, the pseudo 3D thing really well, given the asymmetric perspective. Mm-hmm. It kind of reminded me of the sprites from Mario Kart 64. Yeah. Because they're like, sprites and not 3D models. Yeah. 64 being the, like, important yeah. bit of information there, showing how far ahead of its time it was. Well, not really time as much as generation. It was, this was like a really late SNES game, wasn't it? Yeah, it yeah, actually a... released in the same year as Mario 64. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Yeah, 1996. It was the year that the N64 came out. So, mm-hmm. uh, very extremely late. That being said, the I think SNES got last... a lot of support, even post- yeah. posthumously. Because well, I think was... this was the last game that Square and Nintendo made together. Or like the last game that Square made for a Nintendo platform, rather. Right, for... At least a while. Well, yeah, until... Until more recent times. Until, like, the GameCube or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, like, on the end... Yeah, Jesus. I didn't even think about that, because Square... When did Square subsume they, Enix? Oh, God. That was in, like, after Kingdom Hearts 1. So after 2001. Yeah. Wait, seriously? Yeah, Kingdom yeah. Hearts 1 is a Square, is Square Soft, Soft game. Yeah. It is wow. indeed. I actually didn't know that, yeah. because I'm not tapped into Squaresoft. Well, yeah, I've seen the title screen for Kingdom Hearts Probably Arts a thousand so times. Many times. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Them graphics. Them graphics. Right. Are really good, but that isn't what we're talking about. Yeah, we're talking about the aesthetics. Correct. And uh, I have to say, I almost like, when they made this game, they took... The Mario game aesthetic mm-hmm. and attempted to apply it to an RPG. And in an RPG, you're typically dealing with what are kind of like some variant on like a fantasy setting. Yes. Uh, now, Squaresoft, I guess, like kind of like famously introduces like a lot of technology into it. Like they're almost like science fiction y. Yeah, that like seven onward has had that kind of cyberpunk look. Yeah, yeah. We gone are the days of the red mage and the black mage and whatever mm-hmm. else. Uh and yeah, materia and shit became right. a thing. Uh but I, I find it really amusing how like the Mario enemies were sort of just like they didn't make an attempt at putting them into like a fat like they're just straight up Final Fantasy monsters in this game, but they'll be fighting alongside like a Goomba, <laughs> like just a regular <laughs> ass Goomba. One of the bosses just tosses Goombas at you occasionally. The bomb guy will just like fucking just toss a Goomba in your face. It's so weird. I kind of really love it. <laughs> yeah, I actually think it's the best thing about the game is how much they leaned into the Mario aspects of it and like how well it comes together. It's you can tell places where they tried to innovate on the Mario aesthetic. I think Gino as a character is exactly what you'd think of if you had to combine Mario Land with like old style Final Fantasy V and before Square Enix characters. Yep, but they it, it goes beyond that though. The the antagonists being these weird you can understand if you squint versions of weaponry is <laughs> yeah. is, mm-hmm. is a nice touch. It, it, they made they tried to make things uh, as not menacing as possible while still being menacing enough that they could conceivably be considered villainous. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you compare, like, this is that Nintendo influence we were talking about before, where the stakes of this game are that wishes will no longer come true, <laughs> is, yeah. like, just low bar enough 
that like it's basic it's like the most family friendly consequence in a uh, in RPG. Well, it goes a little bit further than that. It does like, get a little bit deeper. Like the sword that falls out of the sky or whatever right. like creates like a portal between two dimensions. Yeah. Which is like an evil dimension. Dude, but how many kids are actually going to get to that point? <laughs> uh, not very many. Well, unless you're a kid from the 90s, and you probably put a lot of hours into this. Yeah, it's, because it was yeah. the one game that you had. Yes. Similarly <laughs> yeah. so uh, to Earthbound, it's got that Saturday morning cartoon feel. But then it it deepens and becomes a darker thing if you get closer to the Well, end. yeah, in Earthbound, but not in this. Really. It's not so much... I want to much. forward the distinction between dark and gritty here. I don't think this game ever gets anywhere close to dark. I think it gets <laughs> literally darker because you're in a, a factory at the end of the game. Mm-hmm. Right. But it's never... Like, through the entire experience, the tone is nothing but straight levity, even when you're against the, like, megalomaniac... Uh, Iron Forge Man. Smithy? Smithy. Smithy. Sure. Yeah, the, the main villain's name is Smithy. Smithy. <laughs> For uh, perspective there. Yeah, very uh, on the nose. <laughs> Given. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> you always know for that Mario brand subtlety. <laughs> So that's actually. Okay, so the one thing I wanted to mention about the aesthetic specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that yeah? It does include a lot of the uh, the Mario sensibility and like it, it takes place like in the Mushroom Kingdom, like whatever. Yeah. The thing that like stands out to me is that despite coming out in '96, this game uses like what I guess what you sort of would imagine the the NES era Mario games realized would be like, whereas like. The existence of Super Mario World is what kind of fucked me up because the Super Mario World sort of cemented this like idea of what the Mario World was, mm-hmm. and it was different than this by a lot. Yes, <laughs> yes, they made tons of concessions to match RPG tropes in mm-hmm. this game that Nintendo would never make in a product designed to do nothing but be like a hyper-polished mechanics-first experience Mm -hmm. in their 2D platformers. See, I had a very different perception of the game because I've never played Super Mario World. I didn't own a Super Nintendo. But uh, I, I was actually, like, my theory was that, like, or not my theory, but my take on it was that this was the game that really fleshed out, like the Mario, like, aesthetic. Because, like, I I was like, is the reason people know the names of Mario enemies because of this game? Like, people know, like, a Wiggler is called a Wiggler because of Mario RPG. And it's like, it, 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 like, does, like, a deeper dive into, like, all the stuff that was probably in design documents at Nintendo that they already had, but, like, the general public didn't know. The... But, like, I don't know if Mario World was the spawning of a lot of this stuff. There was probably a a significant overlap between people who had played Mario RPG and Super Mario World, and the knowledge of of, uh, the Mario, like, lore, (laughs) For lack of a better term. Yeah, (laughs) probably comes from a little bit of both. Uh, But, like, what previously existed in... It, this is this was the strength of, of making an RPG in the SNES and NES eras, is you could convey a lot more innov- uh, information with text on the screen, whereas like a platformer is not really going to be able to do that. Uh, if you know the enemy names of, Mar- of Mario enemies, you either A, read the instruction booklet, or B, finished the game and saw the awesome credit sequence where it actually <laughs> names everything. And the Super Mario World credits are where all of my knowledge of Mario enemies comes from okay. and are some of my favorite credits in all the video games. I wasn't even specifically talking about when I was bringing up how they had to compromise. And compromise isn't the right word because it's not necessarily bad, but like mold the aesthetic to RPG tropes. I wasn't talking about like the way that enemies looked aesthetically. What I'm talking about are things like the fact that this game introduces into the Mario universe like literal towns like i i it's hard for me to picture Mm -hmm. in like the super mario world style depiction of the mushroom kingdom like they're just being like a restaurant 
or yeah. like an inn <laughs> that people go to. I think that's true of the 2D games, which would have been the ones that preceded Mario RPG. Like I could see that kind of stuff existing in the 3D Mario games, right. which preceded this. And you have to wonder how much of like the the credit for that like goes to Mario RPG. It, Mario, the Mushroom Kingdom, generally is so not grounded. It is so <laughs> high in the sky yes. most of the time. You know that Peach has a castle in it, and that's about it. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, otherwise it's just a place full of crazy-looking images and, and just a, an excuse toads. for what, whatever mechanic they wanted to introduce at the time. Right. No more, no less. But now we have, like, these implications that there's something related to, like, a culture... And that there's like people together living in different spaces, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like races. I, I really like that. Yeah, it's something that uh, they did sort of flesh out. Like, so of the the Mario RPG games, I've played now this one and Superstar Saga. I haven't played any of them. No. They've all been on my list for a long time, and I've <laughs> never played any of them. So this is the first one. Check. Yeah. So <laughs> Super Mario Saga does a great job of sort of fleshing out uh, the idea of like the Mushroom Kingdom as like a world because it has other like you know group like as a fantasy world anyway it has like different races of beings or whatever and they congregate in similar areas like they do in an RPG. Yeah. This game doesn't quite do that because, like, everyone is a toad, and then, like, they're the mole people from the, right. the mining town. And or the whatever. cloud people and the village of reformed monsters. And there's, like, the tadpole village. Right. But they all seem really far flung and, like, don't intermix at all. Yeah. Uh, it, which is, I mean, once again, this is a SNES RPG. This is, like, to be expected. Yeah. The mole people. Was like really seemed out of left field. <laughs> like I'm like cloud people, okay, because like there's always been like the secret cloud levels in mm. Mario. But like, where did mole people come from? And they're not. <laughs> it, they're notably different than the Monty moles introduced in Super Mario World, uh, like a few years prior. Maybe that was the inspiration. It could have been. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good question. They needed a conceit for a dungeon that wasn't that didn't share the pipe aesthetic. Yeah, or at least they were like, we want a mine level. So yeah. Mole- just people? put fucking pipes in it, though. <laughs> and, and no matter where you are in the entire world, there's, like, clown-faced jump pads yeah. everywhere. The clown... That, that always weirded me, because, like, we've talked about this on the, like, Mario Sunshine cast. By the way, re- really great Mario game selection from us. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we're we're weird like that. Yeah. You gotta be, like, the fringe Mario games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, uh, Super Mario 64? Fuck that shit. Mario RPG and Super Mario Sunshine. That, that's the cream of the crop. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> really gotta get those views. Uh, <laughs> We're really concerned about the numbers here. <laughs> but as we talked about on the Sunshine episode, uh, there are lots of, like, things with faces, and this has been, like, a Mario staple forever. The fact that there were... Mario has had springs since the first game, which were like yep. little squares with like a cross mm-hmm. in them, and you jump on it, it bounce to you. Springs exist. Springs are a thing that like <laughs> is pre-established. Why there's a weird clown face spring is beyond me. <laughs> like I, it was like, so jarring. Yeah, they're how like, well, weird we should it put was. a face on it. Yeah, and and like, a weird clown face. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Stamp. <laughs> what about like this? It's, it's, it's a clown face that I need that has the little Nintendo seal of approval. <laughs> what about any of the other like really iconic single images that exist in the Mario universe, like stars, mushrooms, turtle shells, any of oh, that stuff? They're all here. Or we just make it like a fucking little green spring. <laughs> yeah, we can't do that. You've got to. You've, none of those can be the images. Got to be a, a unique like clown car like aesthetic. Like the floaty, creepy cars, but way worse because it's flat and stares at you. Yeah. <laughs> Out from the game, the isometric perspective. <laughs> yeah. We gotta get this isometric perspective in there so that we can finally, after all these years, stop being looking 2D at the springs right. and get above them to reveal the hideous clown face. They had a face it all down. along. <laughs> you just couldn't see it. Mm-hmm. But Mario could. My, yeah, he was like, I hate these fucking clown springs. <laughs> They were always called trampolines, which has like a circusy 
uh, sort of feel to it, connotation, I yeah. guess. So it has this weird ass aesthetic, basically. Is what, like it's a weird melding of yeah. what people perceive the Mario world to be right. and what Square Enix puts in all of their yes. RPGs. Yeah, yeah, it's a interesting interpretation of the Mushroom Kingdom with a with a healthy injection of Square Enix stuff. No, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, it, during the first half, you mentioned like a lack of enemy variety throughout the game, mm-hmm. and I, you you are correct to at least to some extent. It's because of the length of RPGs mostly mm-hmm. that you run into the same sort of enemies that are just like, "Hey, it's the one from earlier, but he's been upgraded. It's like a better version of that now." Mm-hmm. Uh, however, I do think that the enemy design altogether was actually like a SquareSoft game. Super good. Like, everything looked evocative of what it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. The one weird, jarring example was uh, the Donkey... Just Donkey Kong. Like, just yeah. actually Donkey Kong. <laughs> that was really weird. There's a part in Bowser's Keep, when you get back there later, where you have to go through these, like, challenges uh, to get to advance, and one of them is, like, an obstacle challenge... Or you have to, like, platform across some stuff and whatever. And one of the challenges is basically Donkey Kong, the arcade game. You have to, like, Um, go up a series of, like, paths while Donkey Kong throws barrels down it. It's just Donkey Kong. And there's also a very, like, (laughs) Donkey Kong-ass minecart game. Yeah, mm-hmm. that yeah, happens yes. in the yeah. The the weirdly heavily inspired by Donkey Kong Country is kind of mm-hmm. weird. Yeah, strange. That seems like something that a third party who got to work on a Mario game would want to do that just, Nintendo themselves never would. Just right. imply that they don't like Donkey Kong. No, like, no, to put Donkey Kong in the game because uh, right. like Mario and Donkey Kong have been linked since the beginning. And Nintendo, it's just like nah. <laughs> yeah, they split that shit up pretty hardcore in the in the late nineties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pretty hardcore fucking split, yeah. Yeah, it was a hardcore split. Uh, it just sounds like an, an album. I know. Uh, that's why I, I was yeah. trying. I was hoping we would immediately shift into like way too intense language for descriptions of Donkey Kong. <laughs> Donkey Kong is hardcore. He has a he's coconut gun. It fires and bursts. If he shoots you, it's gonna <laughs> hurt. Anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, also, if you use uh, a psychopath on uh, on the Donkey Kong enemy, he will say like, "I hope you don't get me confused with another guy or some such bullshit okay. <laughs> about how he's just the sprite from Donkey Kong." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Speaking of which, what they don't know what the word psychopath means, right? Like, that's just... It's a weird translation. Yeah, it seems like there are kind of a lot of them, and a lot of them seem to be focused on Mallow as a character. Mm. Has seems to have a lot of, like, kind of weird translation issues. I, that's a common problem with games from this time period. Particularly ones with a lot of text. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot for translators to work through, considering the length of JRPGs and the amount of text in them at the time and compared to how little attention that they really got before 7. But is there like a is there an, an established like are there another other examples of a spell like something that you would use in the game and see a lot just clearly being the wrong word. Oh, it's, oh I'm it's, sure. Oh yeah. The uh, the second to final boss of Final Fantasy 7 is a translation error. It, I forget its name. It's Oh yeah, it's, it's um I it's, can't even remember. Oh, wait, no, maybe it would be the final boss. Oh yeah, I think I think the the Sephiroth? last yeah I think I think the last like Sephiroth form where he's like the crazy fucking angel monstrosity. He's just saying Isn't words. The final form, him shirtless. Well, yeah, yeah, but like his lower body, <laughs> his lower body, not not that not the cutscene boss. Okay. Where, when his lower body is like a cloud thing it's with like, like a seven weird wings, angel and thing. one of his arms is a demon wing. Yes, all I, that I remember. That got translated as safer Sephiroth. When it was just supposed to be like like Seraph Sephiroth. Safer. Yeah, safer. That's like the actual safer translation Sephiroth. of that boss. But yeah, like huge, like the biggest RPGs in the world had stupid translation issues like this all over the place. All right, this is the more you know, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But 
this is a rare occurrence uh, in the history of the Noclip podcast where I feel like uh, I've been too positive on a game in my uh, descriptions and conversations about it, uh, particularly in this half because it's Mario and we're, everything is love and fun. Uh, That's true, yeah. Th- playing through this really made me learn uh, how much like the skin over top of any RPG system, especially old RPG systems, being interesting is important to my enjoyment of the experience. Mm -hmm. Because in this game, I felt like because it was just Mario and because I don't have a deep attachment to any of the tropes of Mario innately and Mario's tropes certainly aren't known for their like narrative force, (laughs) I had nothing to latch on to for almost the entire game, where I felt like there was nothing that was happening that I cared about. I didn't feel like the characters were interesting. The, my my favorite parts of the game going through it early were actually the animations that they gave to Mario to try and allow him to convey stuff without text, just because I could think how funny of a problem that would be as like a SNES developer yeah. trying to work mm-hmm. through all this. I do like that they canonically made Mario like a, a, like a polymorph. <laughs> like he could just yeah. take any form. <laughs> <laughs> he is pretty like implied godly in many of the things that he does. That's true. Uh, and so I really didn't get hooked for, a, a, for most of the narrative in any way, even in like the sort of like cute cartoony appeal that we always talk about. With one notable exception that I really do want to call out as a positive, uh, I think this is like emotionally vulnerable Bowser is hilarious. I mean, that's pretty cruel of you. He, <laughs> he takes a lot of abuse. He does. Uh, he is also an abuser. Uh, he deserves it. Sh- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Portrayal of Bowser is also one of my favorite things in the game. Like, like, Because all of the other characters were played like straight with jokes. I, yeah. I don't know if, if that's the appropriate way to call it, where like they're all just sort of their own characters, and... The game, the design is going to be like a little bit loosey goosey with how serious everyone takes every all the events that are happening, uh, but they aren't really twists on their own tropes. Like mm-hmm. Mario's still just Mario. The Cloud King is still not King, whatever that. Mallow. Mallow. He's still yeah. the Cloud Prince. Yeah, the Cloud yeah. Prince. Mallow is still just like the lost child that's in every RPG for some reason, mm-hmm. uh, and Princess Peach is Princess Peach. But they decided to take Bowser. Uh, and we're like, how great would it be if he had confidence issues? Right. Well, which is fair, especially at that point in the game, because, like, sorry, in the games, like, <laughs> in the timeline of Mario games, Bowser's existence is like a final boss in, I want to say, three games at this point. I don't know when, like, Super Mario Land came out, mm. or for that matter, if Bowser was the final boss of the original Super Mario Land. Uh,. Like is like they could have to- they could do what they did in this game and have it be totally like backwards compatible with all previous <laughs> Mario games, because Bowser obviously can't really show emotion as the final boss, but when he does, like in Super Mario World, it's when you hit him in the face he starts crying <laughs> and like <laughs> throws his hands up in the air and spins around in the clown car. Mm-hmm. So like totally like feasible that they would have done that. And also works really well. Yeah. Like, I joke, but yes, it's also just the best part of the game. Yeah. For the most part. It's the kind of thing I wish they would have done more of. Absolutely. There's, like, sub- like, subvert your expectations of what the Mario world would be like. And I don't know how much of that is because Nintendo had to give the go-ahead to everything. Mm. Right. But uh, I feel like this game would have benefited a lot... Or at least, like, if this game were made now, I feel like a lot of the goals would be to, like, portray the Mario universe in a way you haven't seen it before. Whereas, like, at the time, it was, like, just novel that this game existed at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, in ways that it would be funny in, in, un, in a completely unexpected fashion, which was also something they managed to do with, like, Bowser's lines in context. In the same dungeon right after you get him with the crazy uh, tooth mouth man... Oh, it's like it looks like Wario. Uh, Booster. 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 That's yeah, that's him. Which, it, what a bad name as well. Yeah, yeah. why isn't he just Wario? <laughs> I think they want to... Because he looks exactly like Wario and all of the other Boosters look like Wario. So I feel like there's some kind of weird implication there. Mm-hmm. There should have been some kind of an Easter egg. Did Wario exist at the time? 
When did Ooh, Super Mario Land That's take a come great out? point. <laughs> that's a great point. <laughs> I'll just confirm whether we're right, exists you look that up. Time in the meantime. But anyway, in the meantime, I, I'll clarify. Did I don't know if it, I, I think it was a secret. Did you guys find the hidden chain chomp weapon for Bowser in yeah, that level? Yeah, I got it. That was I, like jokes like that are what I wanted to just be this entire game. Yeah, well, uh, I recommend playing Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga good. because it is just a like a, an actually hilarious game. Yeah, That's my biggest issue with this game's tone as a whole, and it's not really its fault so much as it is translation plus the time like that it came out, mm-hmm. is that the game was never. The game did a good job of setting a tone of levity, but it never really succeeded in making me, like, bust up. It, like, it doesn't have, like, jokes in no. it. No. It has, like, silly moments. Right. It plays itself so straight for its conceit. Yep. And, and like, it has Gino, who is the perfect character to just take the full brunt of carrying the narrative. Yes. Like, he could have just... Literally rolled the entire narrative himself, and yeah. everyone else just been a jackass. And, it would have and been great. Mallow too, like their original characters could have carried the narrative for them, and they just didn't do that. Right. But uh, now I was talking to Chad earlier today, and we were well, talking. We were talking about the narrative, and he was like, "So what happens in this game?" Because he only got you know to four stars, and I was like. Uh, well, you collect seven stars, and then you beat the boss, and then everything's back to normal. <laughs> like, <laughs> nothing, it, the plot is so straightforward, mm-hmm. and, like, the only real twists in it at all are that, like, Bowser joins your party, and Mallow's a prince. And Gino is a doll that comes to life. Yeah, and that, that's a nice little moment, But too. they're all party-related things. Yeah, yeah. And, and, like, other than that, you just truck through... A linear path to the end and fight the bad guy. Trudge. Like, you trudge. You trudge through it. Through it. <laughs> and it seems also that, like, Mallow's the only character that goes through any, like, real development as well. Yeah. Because Gina's kind of, like, already developed. Yeah, yeah has, Gina's like, a clear got goal an, in yeah, mind. Gina's got an interesting setup, but no kind of. Yeah. yeah. Development is exactly the kind of stuff that would get hammered down by a collaborative project like this. Because you can't have, certainly at this stage in the Mario <laughs> Empire's development. Any narrative arc for Mario yeah, right. would probably Peach either. Certainly not Mario and highly resistant to any sort of development for the rest of them. Mm-hmm. Like, Bowser, once again, being the shining example of, like, had a little bit of something going yeah, for him. There's even a part at the end in the credits where it, they show Bowser like helping to rebuild his castle alongside a bunch of Koopas. Mm-hmm. And I'm like... That's a nice moment. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, he's like, he's helping his uh, his lackeys do the work. Mm-hmm. That's nice. Bowser. Gotta get in there with the slaves sometime. Yep. Yep. I also, thought, just yeah. real quick, gonna confirm <laughs> Wario existed four years before this game came okay, out. Okay, so it should have just been Wario. It should have just been Wario. Yeah. Or it should have been revealed that it was Wario yeah. the whole time. That's what I mean. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like, there should have been, like, at least, like, an Easter egg where you could, like, find his room and he has, like, the Wario clothes hanging up on the wall or something. Right. That would have been great. Booster is, is Wario's true identity. <laughs> He's actually, like, a, a... Comes from a long line of Castellians oh. who, like, watches over this tower of terror. While we're talking about the aesthetics, one thing that kind of shocked me... Do you guys get to Star Hill? Yeah. Maybe. That's where the fucking aesthetic for Mario Galaxy comes from. <laughs> that, like, shocked me. Like, the, they had the, the, little, the little star bits, star bits were yep. there. And I was like, wow. Oh, man. <laughs> this I existed can't... in 1996. Those star bits contain the wishes of the people from the Mushroom Kingdom. Yeah. And you just fucking shoot them at and I some, think, like, mole game. I think there's some kind of, like, <laughs> similar explanation as to what they are in Mario Galaxy. Mm-hmm. Like, that, that was weird for me no yeah i actually didn't i didn't make that connection because i was thinking of earthbound the whole time because mm. it had like almost an earthboundy sort of like that part did unsettling yeah. soundtrack and the palette was way darker mm-hmm. yeah it felt like i was playing earthbound yeah. again i felt like speaking of earthbound this game not like quote unquote needed to have like an earthbound-esque kind of plot that like maybe started out like wholesome Mario 
what you would expect, right? And then just completely veer into something like totally unexpected. Yeah, yeah. It, it it did half of that. It started with a Mario <laughs> plot, and then it veered into something wholly expected yes. <laughs> after it was explained to you in detail where the plot was going twice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You either needed something that like made you take the narrative more seriously by having it catch you off guard, or you needed jokes, more jokes. Yeah, more jokes is a great. That's the. The, the tagline, it's Super Mario RPG, Legend, Legend of the Seven more Stars, jokes. needed more jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, speaking of jokes, because uh, I assume that this had to have been a joke because it amused me to no end. Uh, this game has the chillest clouds. <laughs> like, the most, are you aware, because you got to this part, like all the clouds that are in the cloud, not the cloud people, like the actual clouds with faces in the background. Mm-hmm. They are the most swell dudes, I have to imagine. Like, look, they're, I'd have a picture of them. I'm uh-huh. going to use it for something. I don't know what, uh, but I'm going to... I let's... know that they had a face on them. Okay, here we, here and we go. And I didn't think it was unusual, because clouds in Mario always, always have, have faces, faces on them. Right, right, right. They always have faces, but they don't always have expressions. Normally, when you have a face on a thing, well, like it's a like the like blank, like, eh, happy face that every five-year-old draws, because they believe happiness is what life is. So... That's not a blank expression, though. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's 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 <laughs> hollow behind it. You know that there is that's not that that smiley face doesn't belong to a person. You don't feel like there's more qualities behind the smiley face. You just feel like it's an emotion, like drawing a heart or something. Like it's a okay. depiction of a feeling instead of a depiction of a person's face. I understand face. what you're saying, but I've never mm-hmm. associated that with Mario. Now think of that face. Okay. The, the generic one. Think of the lack of. And then cloud. look at this chill fucking cloud. Okay. Just going okay. through life. He's got that do- wide smile. <laughs> Doing like whatever he goddamn wants to do. Just like, yeah. That's a pretty outstanding cloud. Yeah, I'm just uh, fine. Yeah, you'll need to send that to me so I can put it in the episode description. Good. Yes. <laughs> and I, let's just make that the art for this episode. <laughs> it's not happening. Uh, but, but then we won't have to pay you your commission. So. <laughs> All right. I have... Uh, this totally belonged into the, in the discussion of translation errors. Uh, but... Uh, I really need to point out that uh, one of the last things the final boss says, like in his death throes, is, and I quote, uh, my body and head are burning, end quote. (laughs) My body and my head are burning. Not not my, my body and head. That's that's the kind of thing you have to put in there when the main villain has no bearing on the plot whatsoever. (laughs) Wow. All right, so I'd say the podcast and our heads are burning. <laughs> so do we have any final thoughts on this? Um, I guess just to reiterate what I said earlier and kept wanting to bring up but I had to stop myself is like my big takeaway from this is I feel like it, it was held back in its limitations. Like I felt like it could have used some more music like it could have used some more enemies. I felt like it could have like used a fleshing out of combat mechanics. It is like I feel like the limitations of the times really held this game back from what it could have been. And you know, <laughs> Square and Nintendo seem to be playing nice again. I wouldn't mind seeing a Super Mario RPG two. Uh, wink, 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 hints. <laughs> uh, Nintendo who will never listen to this. We don't know. But uh, <laughs> those are my thoughts. I completely agree. Uh, with all of the limitations this game clearly has, this game uh, is an artifact. It is not a it's not a classic in my mind. It is something that is interesting to look back on and think back on. But do not go back and play this. Really, as sad as it is for me to say that, I like read about it, look up screenshots, know what they did in the history. It's like trying. It's like going to a museum and picking up like an ancient Incan bowl and trying to eat cereal (laughs) out of it. Like, it's going to just break because it's just shitty bowl that's incredibly fragile from age and time. And it's not going to be a rewarding experience. But you can it can still be a super interesting experience if you take, if you look at it and learn from it and its place in history and not try and use it for what it was trying to be and used at at the time when it came out. Uh, I understand what you're saying, but I would kind of disagree with that. I know you would. Uh, I still, I think, 
I understand why it doesn't appeal to you, but I feel like a lot of people could like today could still play this and get a lot out of it if you're the right kind of person. If you're a huge Mario fan, or if you're just like a huge like old JRPG buff and you want to play them all, like. I yeah. could see you really getting into this. Yeah, that's the uh, that is the demographic that I would say can take the most out of this game. Is if you are somebody who appreciates like the old era of RPGs, if you're somebody who doesn't like the way that RPGs have gone in recent times, this is like exactly it's old square at its like its finest, like uh, not finest in terms of like quality but like as if it was ground into a powder that yes. instills the essence of Squaresoft <laughs> into whatever you add it to. If you have ever used the phrase uh, the golden age of video games in your life, you are the market for this game. <laughs> in, in 2017. Yeah, yeah like, like yeah. today. Like if you've used it in conversation in the last year. Yeah, then... I feel like th- this is one of the few games that like we've talked about before nostalgia actually kind of overshadows uh paper mario which is basically the that is the spiritual successor to this game and uh it probably holds up a lot better but because this game like people love fucking mallow and gino (laughs) actually i think people hate mallow but people love gino Mm -hmm. uh as characters and they wanted them like in smash brothers and whatnot back in 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 the brawl times and uh i I think that that has given this game sort of like a a second life of its own to Mm -hmm. sort of continue existing Mm -hmm. yep but who knows I, I hated it, that's for sure. <laughs> but <laughs> that's kind of to be expected. <laughs> Another fantastic video game box tagline. <laughs> <laughs> Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. I hated it, that's for sure. Exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> <Shadrunner> <laughs> in 2017. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to No Clip this week. What are we talking about next time? Next time we're going to be talking about Ori and the Blind Forest. Uh, until that time, if you want to get a hold of us, you can do so. All of our contact information is on our website. That's NoClipPodcast.com. Uh, you can look us up on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube. However you're currently listening to us, good work. You found us. Uh <laughs> <laughs> you win. Tell your friends. Yep. And put seven golden coins in... Wait, stars. Fuck. <laughs> I, I got really it's caught up in... Six gold coins. Six golden coins. Set Legend of Seven Stars. Seven stars. Yes. Put those in an envelope right now. Clip on front. <laughs> and send it to us. Send it to us. See y'all later. Yippers. <laughs> See y'all on the back side. Come on so, back now. So would you say that Mario RPG is ancient ink and cereal? Is that what food it is? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have to imagine uh, <laughs> if it was possible for any grain-based food product to, to like persist for a thousand years. Probably uh, cereal. Yeah. If you were to... If, okay. I'll we'll move back to the front of my <laughs> So if we were if we were saying ancient Incan cereal, I think the only cereal that matches the ancient Incan like aesthetic that we know and love. I have no idea what you're gonna say. It's gonna be it's, go, it's golden grams. Okay. Because not only do they look like sort of like brown building blocks, but they also taste like they were made of stone. <laughs> <laughs> With a layer of shitty honey on the outside of it. Okay. I would I would say you are correct. My first response to that was like, oh no, push back against the Golden Grams comparison. <laughs> but 
I really do think you've nailed if you're if the comparison is supposed to be the Incan Empire like at its height. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. Incan Empire was like full of like color and life and spice. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think, however, if we're talking about the degraded ruins of the Incan Empire, the more accurate serial comparison, and uh, this is going to be real real reach for me. Because I don't remember the name of the cereal, Ooh. and there's a low chance he'll have eaten it because it's pretty bad cereal. Uh, <laughs> there is this General Mills brand that is, that whole thing is like brown, sort of grainy oats that are in a square shape, but they're three dimensional like bricks and have a hole in the center, such that they seem like some kind of strange ancient form of currency <laughs> that you would exchange. <laughs> <laughs> like in, in old timey like fantasy representations at, at first I of just coins. You were talking about mini weeds. So. No, no. Oh, wait, okay, hold on. When you say, are they like the 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 bad part of Lucky Charms, <laughs> like the actual cereal? Like they're like a a small shaped thing. Oh, they are not. They are bigger than those. And you're correct. It is a shaped thing. Okay. It's a Would they bigger bar. than that? Yeah, yeah they're, they're How like, uncomfortable to they're eat like, is this? They're like this big each per cereal uh, building block. <laughs> and they're about like that thick individually. They're an old person cereal. And they're, they're square shaped with a square hole as if they are like a fantasy form of currency. Right. Uh, okay. And they are made or of you a... you could build an abacus out of it. <laughs> <laughs> they are made of like a dark, deep, almost like mahogany brown... A uh, grain mixture, and when you you bite into them, you taste sugar and thick grain. Well, if they're an old people cereal, they wouldn't have sugar on them. Well, they, they're sugary Are they enough. Like sugar snaps? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> they're they're sugary enough that you aren't just like tasting a texture, if you know what that means. They're not like plain corn flakes. Uh, they, these do have something to them enough that young me was like, "Oh, I want to eat this weird building cereal <laughs> that everyone seems to be p- buying for some reason." Lego cereal. I think it was my father who had who had a real a real attachment to this strange and ancient God cereal. Damn it! I googled old people cereal, and I think the first result is the right one. <laughs> no. No. is it this? Yes, it's correct. <laughs> Sorry, crackling the oat to bread. <laughs> all right, all right, everybody, calm down. Crackling the oat to bread. This is the part I'm actually putting into the podcast, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. The food that best represents Super Mario RPG. Is a bowl of cr- is an ancient Incan bowl full of crackling oat bran. Wash it down with some Brad's drink. Good night. <laughs>